Dirty Sock Shotgun Talk. My name is Dr. Rhea. Some people call me Faya. I've got something to say. Allow me just one prayer. from the mental block. Shut it up! Like, oh my god, and what the fuck? Shut it up! So turn it up. Let's sit right back. Shut it up. Aloha! I apologize for the traffic. It's rush hour here in Hawaii. Today is October the 5th, 2010. I am at the Kalia Cemetery where both Carlos Almaraz, my late husband, and my mom, Maria Flores Valenzuela, have laid to rest. And I'm here October 5th because it is Carlos' birthday. Today, he would have been 69 years young, and he would have so enjoyed that, being the nasty little boy that he was. This grave marker was designed by Jeffrey Valens a internationally known artist and one that Carlos mentored. He included many of the icon icons that Carlos used in his work. We've also inlaid an etching of Echo Park. And Rebecca Rickman, a good friend of ours, wrote this beautiful writing shortly after Carlos's death. I'll read it to you. Carlos Almaraz. October 5th, 1941 through December the 11th, 1989. Loving husband, father, and friend. His vision dominated the world he painted, vibrant like him, pulsating with color and light. Mad dogs, lovers and fools, burning cars, pyramids and palm trees, wondrous and passionate, taking his secrets with him, but leaving many clues behind. Here lies a chap, quick as a cat, and short one life. Carlos wrote that last quote in one of the many journals he's left, many po poems that he had written, quite prolific. So I'm here in honor of Carlos, celebrating him. I've brought these amazing tropical flowers from my garden. Such abundance on this little island. Here's my mom, Maria Valenzuela. Oh, her love's a little crooked today. These are made of coral pieces found on the beaches here. And of course, Maria Flores, whose birthday was just a few weeks ago. She and Carlos had a beautiful relationship. They really loved each other very much. Yes, Carlos and I very, very happy. Very, very happy. But we're not enough years. Ten years is just not enough. But you know what? I'm grateful for those ten years. I'd go through all the sorrow and the tragedy and the ugliness of this disease any time. I'd do it again to have had that time with him. Such magic such an urban shaman that he was, sharing his gifts with me, but taking his secrets with me. Hello. Right on. Hey everybody, welcome to another special Shaka Talk, and it's super duper special, because I'm with one of my favorite people in the world, my Auntie Elsie. Hey. <laughs> real kind, real kind Auntie. Yeah, real kind, like my blood kind. Oh yeah, welcome to Shaka Talk. Um, she's like a... Um, painter, this is what I can think of. A painter, I wrote down. Um, what else? A photographer, musician, filmmaker, and she's making, you were making a movie, um, but it's on hold right now. Are you going to start painting again? Mm -hmm. okay. We're in downtown LA right now, by the way. We're in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, but I'm a bi coastal. I'm a Kauai girl, yeah! Totally. <laughs> so here in LA, I've got a couple public art. Uh, projects three actually in the city one's a fountain at the metro station downtown 
You made, you designed a fountain? Designed, built it, made you built it ceramic. Yourself. Yeah, full-on ceramic handmade fountain. Oh, wow. fountain. Okay. It's in the shape of a phallic, too. It's this vaginal shape with this big staff coming out and this throbbing heart, the heart of the city, a glass heart Ooh. that like, lights up. Wow. Um, they didn't catch it. <laughs> the sensors didn't catch it. And then I have a big, uh, big long mural at um, downtown LA at the courthouse that Carlos and I were commissioned, my late husband Carlos Almaraz, uh -huh. whose remains are buried on Mama Kauai. Yeah. And um, we have, we, we did this big mural, 70 foot mural painting. called California, painting called oh. California Dreamscape. Mm -hmm. And then. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there. We oh, should sure. go and look at it. Okay. Yeah, we should do a little art tour downtown. Wow. Okay. And then, the, it's a small commission, but what was, was exciting is that my El Sereno, where I grew up here in Los Angeles in the barrio, uh, I used to go swimming at the plunge. We called it the plunge. It was the public pool, uh -huh. the El Sereno pool. And they were building a new pool. And so I was like, I competed for the commission. I was a local girl and I got it. And I got like, I, I put this mural inside. It's an indoor pool now. Uh -huh. So I have a mural in my old inside a pool. childhood pool. Yeah, in a building with a wow. pool. Wow. Did people skate it? <laughs> no, they skated the fountain, though. They're really, oh, really? ripping it up. Yeah, they're oh. grinding and all the, the, the bull nose on, on the ceramics. Yeah, stuff. boner. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, right on. So, that's public. And so, somebody buys it from you, and then they give it to the state, or the state? No, no, you, you compete. You compete oh, for okay, these okay. commissions. They announce it, and you go, and you all these artists compete. And a panel uh, decides who they want to give the commission to. Okay. So that supported me. That those you know those those are really helpful to artists because it really helps support you going keep going you know for your studio and pays for you fabricating the piece. And so you 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 spend a lot of time trying to get. How do you make money? <laughs> <laughs> I have my tricks. Okay. It's really hard to sell artworks in this climate mm -hmm. right now. But prior to that, I was selling uh, a lot of my late husband's work from the estate. He died. It's going to be 20 year anniversary in December, December 11th. So really? okay. his work was really popular. He was famous when he died. So I was able to, to sell his work. When did he die? December 11th, 1989. He died of AIDS. He died of AIDS? Mm -hmm. Wow. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> but then what are you allowed to talk about when you talk about that? I know. Especially from that time. And like, yeah, that uh, time. Because I didn't know what was going on. I thought I was just being lazy because he wasn't like going out and doing all the stuff that I remember doing yeah, with him. Really active all yeah, time. we were always like, "Let's go," uh -huh. <laughs> and like, and then he kind of slowed down, and I was, I didn't know what was going on. But then eventually, I heard he was sick, but I didn't know that he was like, uh -huh. I didn't know what what that kind of sick was. Anyway, I don't think anybody did back then. Oh, it was just the beginning. So you were starting yeah. to hear about this, you know, this dreaded disease, uh -huh. and and you know, he had been bisexual in for many um, years of his life, and when he was living in New York as a young artist, he was full on gay. You know, uh -huh. and he had been molested as by a priest and an uncle when he was a kid. So he was confused. He really felt like I must be gay, but he didn't really enjoy gay gay sex. Uh -huh. And so he went through years of therapy, re realized he was just like damaged from like the pedophiles that messed with him. And oh um, so he wanted to go, to move into you know a heterosexual lifestyle. And when we met, it was just perfect timing. And you know, what did you mean? Oh, I met him like when I was 19. We were doing, I was doing grassroots work in the barrio, uh -huh. and so was he. He was a member of a collective called Los Four. Okay. And so with Los Four, they came to my committee, the Committee to Free Los Tres. I was working for a, a political prisoner group, and I was art, the art liaison, because I was doing all the posters, and so they hooked us up, and we met, and then it wasn't until... Years later, we started working at cultural centers together, and I always knew he was, like, sweet on me. Uh -huh. He would give me the goo-goo eye, and I was like, <laughs> oh, he'd give me the goo-goo eyes, but I always felt he was so old, you know, because he was, like, 14 years older than I was. Oh. And when you're 19, someone in their 30s is, like, over the hill, right? And the cue was Nana, uh -huh. your grandmother, uh -huh. my mother. And I had, I, he convinced a lot of artists to move downtown. He was quite a leader of artists and, and mentor. And so I, I rented a studio above his downtown L.A. And so my car broke down one day. My mom drove me to the studio, and he was in his window. He was voyeuristic. He was always looking out the window. <laughs> the chair, like, wanted to see whether there was prostitution happening. And he was just, like, checking yeah. everything out. And I, was, I pointed him out to my mom to the window. I go, see that man up there, Mom? He likes me, but he's so old. And she's like, oh, son los mejores. 
Like, they're, they're the best. <laughs> on. Yes, like fine wine. So I went out with him. It was the rest was history. Wow. Yeah. So he was was he really popular then? Yeah, like, he was like the leader of the Chicano art movement, total leader. But at that point, when we hooked up, he was ready to make a transition into back to his own studio work. Oh. And so what he did was he did that, and the Chicanos missed him, and they really kind of bashed him. They felt like he had sold out, you know, yeah. to galleries and uh-huh. to capitalism, because he was so hardcore, as we'll see in the manifesto. Uh-huh. Back in the day, it was all like pub art for the people, right? And then suddenly he went into private art, because he had so much imagery, other than the political stuff he was doing inside of him, which is what we know him for now, the genius that, that evolved, that uh-huh. came out of his him going back into his studio. And part of that was settling down, you know, like hooking up with me, having our daughter, and just that grounded him so much that he produced amazing amounts of work before he died. But, you know, his, his lifestyle, his sexual lifestyle caught up to him because it incubated for years before it came out and no one knew much about it. His body had already been messed up because he almost died of alcoholism in New York. And so he died in two years. You know? wow. And now he could have lived. You know, the cocktail people can live forever now. Was there fear of AIDS on your part? Of course, yeah. When he was first diagnosed, I immediately thought I had it. We had seven years of unprotected sex. Okay. And so, you know, yeah, well, let's, then I said, let's keep having sex since, you know, I'm sure we have it. And his doctor said, no, 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 you might have different strains, you know, let's test you. And they tested me state-of-the-art tests, and I didn't have any one iota of the virus in my body. I either have a really strong immune system or it just wasn't my path to get that. And so, so then we had to have protective sex, you know, after that. So it was amazing because, of course, my, my, sec- my biggest fear beyond myself was our daughter, Maya, who was four, four years old at the time of his diagnosis, oh. that she must have it. If I have it, she has it. So, oh. of course, I thought I had it. But, wow. And I, I believe I was saved because, you know, we weren't into... We weren't into anal sex. I mean, I wasn't. You know, and he was over it. He didn't. He didn't want to have anal sex. So it really saved my life because uh-huh. that's where it was a lot of tearing and blood, and you know, yeah. like that's where there's just more danger in that type of sexual activity. So wow, that's such a weird story. Like for you not to have it come out yeah, at that no. time, <laughs> you know, that time where it was like yeah, everybody's gonna get it. But I've heard stories like that. I have friends of mine, gay friends of mine, uh-huh. who their partners have died, uh-huh. and they've had they had gay sex, uh-huh. and they never they they be, they were immune. They never got it. Wow. Yeah, there's many stories like that. Uh-huh. He was interested in world religions. I mean, he studied everything in his life. And, you know, at the end of his life, the Dalai Lama gave him like blessing. And, really? But he still had that little Catholic guilt thing, like I'm a sinner. So I'm being punished. Everything I ever wanted is being taken away because I was sodomized. And, you know, it's that old Catholic guilt stuff. Wow. And at the end, on his deathbed, he was able to resolve that. He, like, came full circle and he just was able to love again. Oh. Yeah, so it, it, it opened me up to, like, you know, more meaning in life. And after his death, we got lots of messages from him, like things were happening and light like, bulbs going on and off and, you know, messages from him. And still, I'm quite off. I get like physical messages from him. He's uh, he's buried there, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. part of one of the big messages came in a series of messages while I was on Kauai um, that signaled me to make the film on Carlos, because a coffee table book we were um, in the works, but that takes forever to do, and we thought putting something on film will get it out to the public, you know, a People lot can just faster. Spread it around. Yeah, you can do it on the internet. Yeah. Now. And you know, I can edit and all that here at home on my computer here at the studio. So uh, that was it, and the message was, I remember I was at the cemetery, and I was like, okay, Carlos, what do I do now? And I was looking up at the clouds, and the ocean was like over there, and, um, and I heard his voice, he says, start the screenplay. <laughs> like, okay, message received. That he knew that I would, like, I believed in his work, and he believed mm-hmm. in mine, and that I would do everything to, to keep him in the public eye, because, I mean, his paintings are great, and he's under exposed. I mean, yeah. he's such a great painter that a film was going to really like catapult him. He was on the verge of like making it internationally. So is that a big part of your thing is just to get, you know, people knowing about him? 
I just don't want them to forget. And you know what? I don't think they will, but it's kind of like you have to make it happen. Because yeah. I witnessed him. I mean, he was a huge teacher because he, like, knew how to manifest. I saw how he talked about art, how he sold art, how he promoted himself, how he was charismatic, how he, you know, he was like, he, he, he rounded people up, he helped people, he organized artists, and he was always sharing his information. So he was a really big um, role model for me, inspiration, because you know, he, he had some really big uh, public kind of exposure when he was doing the posters for the Olympics, 1984 uh, he did Olympics. the 1984 Olympics. And poster. yeah, prior to that, he did the LA Bicentennial Olympic uh, uh, poster, which like catapulted him to like one of the darlings of LA art. So everyone wanted his work. He started making money. And so we're able to like, all right, let's have a family now. We needed to buy a house. All the money was going to, you know, to taxes. So we went to visit your mom and you guys in Hawaii. And then we went to Kauai for the first time. We said, let's buy it here. Why are we going to buy it in the barrio? And we found like the last fixer up around the North Shore in Kauai. Is there like an art scene in LA? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's always been an art scene. In LA. But like, like, like the politics and the gossip and the tackiness and, mm-hmm. or whatever those kind of things. Sure, that's um, part of it. Did you have to deal with that with being with Carlos? Um, well, it was different because, again, he was like the leader of the Chicano movement, and the Chicano movement seems to be even more gossip, gossipier than, really? you know, the mainstream art movement because uh-huh. it's just like the Latino thing, you know. It's like we, we tend to shoot ourselves in the foot instead of supporting each other when someone does really well. You know, like, you get criticized, like, oh, you think you're too hot for, you know, for your britches, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, oh, who do you think you are? It's like, and that's happened traditionally in politics with our people. That's why we're barely, you know, getting um, political representation, because we're always fighting against our own best interests. And it's just petty, barrio, you know, territorial gang mentality, kind of, you know. But how about... When Carlos pulled himself away mm-hmm. and decided to start a family, did you guys, were people oh, like backlash. shady about that? Or? Huge backlash. Yeah. In fact, I was part, and I was blamed for part of it. They were mm-hmm. saying I took him away from the movement because he was a beloved leader. He was like oh, yeah. a cherished, you know, just charismatic leader. And so when they saw him pull away with me, they felt like I like took him away from them. So I became like the Yoko Ono of the Chicano oh, Party, okay. like, <laughs> you know, the scapegoat. But uh-huh. it was like really he needed to do that, you know. Uh-huh. That's what he left us in the in the in the world. The last ten years of the work that he produced is really what he was here to do. And those kind of messages. So and then there were articles written in the, the LA Times on you know him and criticize, critis, criticizing him and his new capitalistic roots. Really? <laughs> because, you know, he was a socialist and public art, you know, spokesman for free art, and suddenly he's in a gallery. So, but, yeah. but he also uh, served as a role model because he broke the barrier for other Latino artists that all of them eventually followed him. They all wanted to move into and start making money from their art. So not long after Carlos broke that you know, that brown ceiling, glass ceiling. Brown ceiling. <laughs> Everyone else was getting galleries and having shows and selling art. So it was like, you know, he really, he was a visionary. He knew what needed to be done. And he always reinvented himself. He was like Madonna. Like every seven years, and he would write in his journals, every seven years he would transform himself into something completely different. And sometimes they were opposed? Well, or? people who like, no, are more. invested yeah. in you in what your image is mm-hmm. don't want to, you to move on mm-hmm. you can't um, evolve you can't go through one phase because that's the one that people like know you through yeah, yeah, yeah. They that's, what, that's their it. introduction yeah they yeah. want to hold on to it I can t- so he wrote some kind of manifesto oh this was for his his master thesis he went uh, he studied both here and in New York at art schools and when he came back um, after his nervous breakdown and his near death to alcoholism. Um, He went back to Otis to get his Otis Art Institute here in Los Angeles to get his master's in art. And so he, by that time, you know, he was like all New York, like bohemian artist, but when he like had the near death thing and he was out of body and he went through the tunnel of light and he was in a coma for 40 days and they gave him last rites, he was was about to die. So since he didn't die, he came out of the coma and he realized he had to re- be reborn again and suddenly he became a born again Chicano artist or a Chicano person 
because he was known as Charles, and suddenly he, he became a Carlos. And uh, at school, all his work was very political. And when I first met him, his work was very political. And I actually didn't really like his work. It looked cartoony to me, you know, because I never did the stereotypical imagery that, that, you know, the Chicano art movement was promoting or was known for. And part of the thesis was he put all, all these political images in a gallery for his master shows. And he wrote this manifesto to Chicano art. Okay, and you want to show it, like. And yeah. in the movie, mm -hmm. you have um, some help from Zach De La Rocha. Yes. From Rage Against the Machine, mm -hmm. and he reads this. And what else does he read in the movie? Zach reads from Carlos's personal journals. Carlos was. Uh, had 80-something journals that we donated to the Archives of American Art, the Smithsonian Institute. Oh. Um, but there was one book in particular that was like the dark, shadowy side of Carlos, his demons, his fears, his sexuality, it was all, and he was really open about it. And that's why I think he, he is going to appreciate this work that we're doing to promote the other side of Carlos, because his public persona is that of the, the, the charismatic, brilliant artist. Mm -hmm. But he had that deep shadowy side, the demons that fed that art, you know, that, that made him need to make the art. And so, Zach de la Rocha, in the film, we are going to, we're using Carlos's journal to tell the story. We have lots of sound bites of actually Carlos actually speaking, but that's his public story that everyone has heard before. But the stuff they haven't heard is in the journals. And so we wanted Carlos to tell the story in his own words. And since he's, he's no longer with us, we got Zach de la Rocha, who Carlos knew as a child, because Zach's dad, Roberto de la Rocha, was one of Los Four, which was an arts collective Carlos uh, organized back in the day, Chicano Arts Collective. And so um, he knew Zach as a kid. So when I approached Zach, Zach was so happy and excited, and he was in tears. He was crying because he loved oh. Carlos so much. And so his, it's great too, because his voice is kind of like that higher pitch resonance that Carlos's voice is. Mm -hmm. So we got Zach in the sound booth, and he read all, you know, lots of, of uh, passages from Carlos's journals. And one of the things he wrote, he read, was the manifesto. An aesthetic alternative. I propose an art that is not private property an art that will make other artists aware of their real duty as human beings. I propose an art that is not only an inspiration and education, but also an art form that is aggressive and hostile to present bourgeois standards. I do not believe in quality because it's only a monstrous device by which those who can afford quality rule those who cannot. Quality benefits collectors and museums, not artists. It is slaves artists. I would like to see quality replaced with quantity in a true dialectical fashion. This will devaluate the art object and make masterpieces obsolete. There will thus be nothing really unique in art and hopefully no art history as we know it presently. For Chicanos and all other working class peoples, Art must be more than a matter of cultural identity. It must be destructive, better here than on the street. El grito must be heard around the world. It must be loud and con mucha fuerza. El enemigo no es el gabacho, más bien es su banca americana, su swimming pools, su arte y sus guerras que esclavan al mundo. Pero se le está acabando su fuel. Y como dice la canción, la cucaracha ya no puede caminar. No tiene marihuana que fumar. ¿Por qué nosotros, los chicanos, live in the stomach of el monstruo? Y aquí le vamos a dar mucho gas para que cuando eche su pelo se le rompa su fundido. Que no. I used to believe intellectuals had it together, and that workers and campesinos were dirty. But in reality, now that I'm beginning to see and beginning to know workers and campesinos, it is really the bourgeois who are dirty. Intellectuals 
They do not like our way and make it seem shabby. But it's really their way, their system, that is hopelessly in error. They have enslaved us with television, the English language, and their credit system, and we continue to support it. Basta! Que se vayan a la chingada! El movimiento is our only hope. The movement is in the factories, in the fields, and in our homes. The artist must be part of it. He must make an art that is cheap, simple, but alive and relevant. An art for the gente who can't afford it. Art like a corrido. An artist should not need a studio. His studio should be in his pocket, on the sidewalk, and in his mind. Let's make an art that is not only for ourselves, not for museums, not for posterity, and is certainly not for art's sake, but for mankind. Let's make an art that will cause a disturbance, row, and even a small revolution. Carlos Almaraz, muralist, con Safos, 74. Painting is an illusion. It's a picture that someone makes. It's a window to something that may or may not be real.